I, I know I'm getting old because 40 years ago, I went to Bible school with his dad. <laughs> and then uh, his dad moved to Indianapolis, married Brother Mooney's daughter. And now Brother George and Pettigo, uh, he, he's doing his master's degree. And while he's working on his master's degree, he's the administrative assistant at Pentecostals of Greater Hartford with Brother Petoskey. So while he's here in Connecticut, he's going to be traveling a little bit and preaching. So uh, I, I'm glad he's here with us, and I, I know he's going to have a word from God. So Brother Pettigo, come and minister to us. God bless. Well, praise the Lord, Acts 2 Church. Why don't we just take that hand clap and we just go ahead and send it upwards real quick. Can we just worship God for just a few seconds? Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to be in this house, for the opportunity to come and praise your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. You see, I'm so thankful that in a world where coming and gathering like this is not popular, that we have an option to come and worship a God who is greater above all things, greater above my fears, greater above my weakness. My God is a great God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Well, thank you all so much. Brother Hanson, thank you so much for having me here this morning. I'm excited. I was telling him right before uh, the prayer service began, you guys have a beautiful drive up here for, uh, through Hartford. It's gorgeous. All the hills, the trees. I love it. You know, Indiana's very boring. Very boring. Like, it's not an exaggeration that when people say it's just cornfields, People, th people think it's a joke. It's not a joke. That's literally all we have. So when you come to a state where you guys have got a mountain and you've got coasts and you've got beautiful things to drive around, I just want to say I appreciate your state. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. I was excited about the time of worship we had. It was so powerful. And from the reading of the word that we had, I'm going to go ahead and open up. If you want to turn with me, I'll do some preliminary getting to know me, getting to know you things, but we'll go and turn to Jeremiah 32, 6 through 14, if you want to start turning there, and I won't keep you standing too long, I promise. I wonder if before we sing, before we read this verse, I, we were sitting in there in the worship service, and something just hit me. There's an old song, and I know I didn't prepare the musicians, so I was hoping we could just do it a cappella because I don't like to throw things at people last minute, so don't worry about that. But I, it's an older song. I love this song, though. It's just, has anyone ever heard the song, They That Wait Upon the Lord? I wonder if before we even get to this verse, something hit me, and I just felt like we should open with this song. So, they that wait upon the Lord shall be do their strength. We shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord. To wait. Come on, I'm thankful for a God that has to teach me to wait sometimes. I appreciate what Bishop Hanson said before church. Sometimes it's the devil's, it's his goal to get us so distracted and so, and so crazy about what's going on throughout the week that it, we forget to take a little bit of time and say, God, I'm just going to wait on your anointing. I'm just going to wait on your presence for just a moment. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, that's kind of the message. I bring a simple message today. That's kind of my heart today. If we could all just kind of keep that in mind. Let's just wait on the Lord. So let's read this text in Jeremiah 32, 6 through 14. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, the uncle, shall come to thee, saying, Buy thee my field, which is Anathoth. For the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel... Mine uncle's son came unto me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, By my field, I pray thee, that is an Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, for the redemption is thine, for by it thyself. Then I knew this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my, son, my uncle's son, and it was in Anathoth, and the weight of the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed the money and balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both which was sealed according to the law and the custom, and that which was open. 
And I gave the evidence of the purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Maasiah, and the son of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed to the book of the purchase before the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, these evidence, this purchase, both which are sealed, the evidence which is are open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. And just the simple title of this message I want to talk about today is just the right of redemption. The right of redemption. You may be seated. In Jesus' name. I was reading an article about famous things that have happened in the month of September. Uh, in past years and years gone by, and one caught my attention. 1915, there was a man named Cecil Chubbs who lived in uh, the UK, lived in Britain. And on a September 21st, 1915, his wife sent him on a very important mission. He had one job, Mr. Chubbs. He was supposed to go to an estate sale, an auction, and she sent him there to buy dining room chairs. By show of hands, ladies, how many of you would send your husband on a very important mission to buy the dining room chairs for your kitchen? I didn't see any hands. I don't know about anybody else. I I, I didn't see a whole lot of hands come up from the ladies in the room saying, I would send my husband to go buy the dining room chairs. for. it's, It's important, right? It's supposed to match everything else in the house, everything in the kitchen. And there's a reason for this, gentlemen. There's a reason they don't send us to go do things like this. Because instead of dining room chairs, Mr. Cecil Chubbs came back home with no chairs, much to the surprise of his wife, Mary, and she said, Cecil, where are the chairs? And he said, don't worry about the chairs. I got something much better. And oh, I heard it. I heard everyone said, oh boy, did you hear that? (laughs) I got a testimony right there. I felt that in the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, oh no. (laughs) Somebody knew there was, I got something so much better than dining room chairs, right? Well, Mr. Cecil Chubbs comes home with the deed to a tract of land, an acre of land. And he goes, I've got some property. And she said, but I just needed some chairs. I didn't need property. And he said, no, no, this property is going to be beautiful. So they go and take a look out of the property. And honestly, it was pretty ugly. It was just an acre of overgrown grassland with some big rocks in the middle. And it took them years and years, and they never could really figure out what to do with this property. It just sat there. It was just a big field with some large stones in the middle. And Mr. Cecil Chubbs, after three years, and I don't even know if they ever got dining room chairs in those three years, but after three years, he decided that this this land was bringing him absolutely no joy. He couldn't figure out what to do with it. So he was like, you know what? I'm just going to dedicate it to, uh, I'm just going to give it back uh, to the kingdom of Britain. I'm just going to dedicate it back to the British, uh, uh, back to the British. I, I, I don't have anything to do with it. The government should own it. I don't need it. Little did he know that the large stones that were overgrown and covered in shrubbery and vines that were laying on that land turned out to be the most ancient wonder of the world, Stonehenge. And Mr. Cecil Chubbs had been sitting on top of Stonehenge literally for three years and never knew what it was until he gave it back to the British government and they said, do you know what this is? And he said, no, I don't have a clue what this is. I know it's not a dining room chair. We have multiple stories like this throughout history where people don't understand the value of what they're holding in their own hands. They don't ever see what's going on. There's another story where there was a, a scrap metal artist, and he, was, he kind of did scrap metal trading and would sell it for money. And he found this little gold ornament, right? A little gold ornament. It didn't mean anything to him. He's saying, maybe I can melt it down and sell the gold and get some money for that. Well, as he got closer to the day that he was going to do this, he said, well, maybe I should just check, take it to you know, a broker and see what, what, what this thing is worth. Little did he know that this tiny little gold egg that he was holding was one of the eight original missing Fabergé eggs given to the Russian royal family in the 19th century. And he bought it at a flea market. I mean, if that's even unbelievable, there was a man in Michigan in 1988 who his doorstop, he found a 22 and a half pound hunk of iron that he was using as a doorstop. Never really cared what it was. It was a doorstop. It was functional. It did what it did. Until a man walked up and he said, that's not a doorstop, man. He's like, what do you mean it's not a doorstop? It's been doing a great job it's stopping the door. Like, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And he's saying, no, 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 it's not a doorstop. He goes, what you're holding in your hand right there is a 22 and a half pound meteorite that fell from space. Worth $100,000 after they sold it to the Smithsonian. 
So sometimes I think humanity, we, we struggle sometimes finding the value of what we hold in our hands, correct? We live in a society where everything has to be instant. And if we cannot ascribe an instant value system to something, we often leave it behind. We often, we often just push it aside. If it's, not, if it's not advertised in the news, if it's not new and it's not shiny and it doesn't work fast, sometimes we can push it aside and say, you know what? I just don't see the value in that. I don't see the worth in that investment. Why would I invest in something that doesn't, I don't understand. Why should I invest in something that doesn't make sense to my own mind, that doesn't bring any immediate benefit to my life? We struggle with this as human beings because we're so based on instant gratification. We want to feel good right now. And I can't help but think that maybe this is exactly how Jeremiah felt. Because if we, we look at Jeremiah's life up until this point in this chapter, he's been spending most of the chapter warning Israel, correct? Saying, hey, the word of the Lord is coming to me and saying, we've been disobedient. We did not follow his ways. We didn't do what God commanded us to do. And because of that, the Babylonian kingdom is going to come against us. And we're going to be taken into captivity. And over and over and over, he keeps prophesying, saying, please, let's repent. Let's go before the Lord. Let, let's get our lives right. Let's get our hearts right. Let's get everything right. And the government, they, they just won't hear it. And they said, no, I just, I, no, you're wrong. How, who are you to say? Who are you to say that Israel's going to fall? Are you a traitor? Or are you don't believe in your own nation? He's not saying, no, it's not that. I'm just saying this is the word of God that came unto me. We better turn back to his ways. We better turn back to his life because otherwise we're going to fall into captivity. And where does that land, Jeremiah? He has to live in the court of the prison. They didn't look at him as a prophet. They looked at him as a traitor because they thought he was giving information to the enemy. They thought that he was betraying his own country by saying that they were going to be overran. The prophet trying to do his job, just the man trying to walk after God's will, is now stuck in prison. Now, I can't imagine being stuck in prison and then all of a sudden God saying, Hey, I know this is a bad time, but your cousin is about to show up and he has a little bit of land that he wants you to buy. If I'm stuck in prison, there's absolutely no reason for me to go out and buy a house, is there? Because I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm, I'm here. Like, I'm stuck. I, there's no, I'm not going anywhere soon. So I can't imagine Jeremiah's mindset when he says, God's saying, you know what? I'm sending you your cousin, and he's going to come and sell you this land. And Jeremiah's like, well, what do you mean you're going to sell me this land? I, I'm stuck in prison. Not only that, what I've been prophesying about what you've been speaking to me. You know that the, the, the Chaldeans are literally outside the gates right now? The land that you're asking me to buy, the things that you're asking me to do, the steps that you're asking me to take, are already out of my control. They're already out of my reach. It's already owned by something else. Why should I make that investment? But what we see Jeremiah do is, besides all that fear and besides all that unknowns, what does Jeremiah do? He doesn't just say, you know, God, I don't see the worthwhile investment that I'm just going to pass it by. What does he do? He said, I don't understand this, God. I don't understand why you're calling me to do this, but I know one thing is that you are the God of good things. You are the God who thinks good thoughts towards me. You are the God who wants to give me us an expected end. I wonder if anyone knows today, it doesn't matter what your fear is right now. If God is calling you into a place, if God is calling you into a deeper devotion, if God is calling you into a deeper walk with him, there is safety in knowing that God is the God of peace. So what does Jeremiah do? He says, you know what? I don't understand. I'm stuck in prison right now. I don't get it. But what I am going to do is I'm going to buy this land. And it was confirmed to him. His cousin came into the prison and said, here, I have this tract of land. And by the right of redemption, it is yours to buy. You're my family. You can buy this. He said, okay, that's what God has asked me to do. I know this is the world of the Lord. It's been confirmed to me. So he steps out in faith. He steps out in faith and he buys this tract of land without knowing anything is going to happen. You see, I thought it was interesting. G. Campbell Morgan writes, obedience by faith does not mean that there will be no inquiry. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be any questions or no sense of difficulty. If there be no risk, there be no faith. You see, sometimes God is calling us outside of our line of sight. You see, the problem with humanity is we can only know the present and we can only see as far as the horizon. We're limited in our scope of life, correct? So the devil will use that every day. And that's why I appreciate so much what you said, Brother Hanson, at the beginning of service. Sometimes he will spend the entire week 
even sometimes between Monday and midweek service or midweek service to Sunday, he will spend all of those days bombarding us with news reports. And he'll bombard us with, with troubles on our job and, and troubles with everything that's going on. And we'll worry so much about that. And we're starting to say, God, I, I know that you're good. And we preach about and we sing about you and we glorify your name. But there just seems to be a lot of things going wrong right now. There just seems to be a lot of craziness happening in the world. I mean, not only is the political climate is becoming more and more dangerous to be a conservative Christian in. We have people being attacked on the streets just for standing up for morality. How dangerous is that for a Christian? God, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a global pandemic going on right now. But you're still calling us to be faithful to a body. You're still calling us to be God, if you haven't noticed that the jobs have been kind of tight right now because the, the nations are shutting down and, and jobs are shutting down, but you're calling us to give to missions. You're calling us to further your ministry. And as much as I love you and as much as I want to give you everything I have, you, you have to understand I'm just a little nervous. I, I can't see the immediate value in these investments. I can't see the immediate good coming out of this, this sacrifice. But if there be no risk, there be no faith. You see, I serve a God who says, no, do you understand who I am? Do you understand what I can do? You're talking to the God who flung the stars into space. You're talking to a God that in a day made the earth, the seas, the animals. You're talking to a God who can do all things, who has all power, all authority, all anointing in his hands. And so we walk forward in faith. You see... We're not looking for a discount. Not only did Jeremiah buy the land, he could have said, listen, I want to buy this land, but I don't want to pay full price. I mean, I can't even own it right now. <laughs> I, I want it, sure, because God told me to buy it, but is there any way I could just get it a little knocked off the top there because I, I can't actually use it? But no, that's not what he did. God asked him to purchase the land, and he purchased it fairly. He gave his all. You see, there's a God that says, For I know that the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me, when ye shall search for me with your whole heart heart. You know, there is a God out there saying, you know, I have great things planned for your life. I have blessings that you don't even understand and you can't even comprehend in your spirit. But if you'll search for me with your whole heart, come on, we're not in this to get a discount. We're not in this to, to push God off to the side and say, God, I, I want just a little bit of blessing, but I don't know if I can give it all. I don't know if I can walk after your spirit. He's saying, trust me. Just trust in who I am. If you'll walk after me, if you'll seek me with your whole heart and your whole spirit, I will bless your life. I'll take you places you never thought you could go. In Jesus' name. You see, sometimes puts us, God puts us in a place where we have to wait. There's a place of pain sometimes where we have to wait. A lot of times I look at it like this. We're all looking for those moments in life that make sense, right? You have to excuse me. I, this is a hobby of mine. I'm an artist. I like to sketch. I like to draw. I've also studied how they make, you know, those little, those little funny things that run across the screen, those little cartoons. I used to study how they made those. There's a thing called a master animator. And when he's starting, if he wants to get a little character to run across the screen, correct? He has to create these little keyframes, which means he'll draw the character perfectly in frame one. But he'll skip about four or five frames and then draw him perfectly in frame five. And then he'll skip another five frames and draw him perfectly in frame ten. And we're all looking for those moments, right, where we're drawn perfectly and life makes sense. And everything is right and, and, and leveled out and, and, and it creates a perfect image of who we want to be. We're successful. Uh, we have the right amount of money, the right amount of security. We have the right amount of influence with our friends and our families. Uh, we have the right family structure. We have everything going on. We have everything under control, right? Those are the moments we're looking for. But no one ever understands what goes on between frame one and frame five. You see, those are the moments where the character is pressed and stretched and the sketches are not as pretty and the artwork is not as gorgeous because they're trying to stretch that character to the next frame and they're stretching that character to the, at the next frame. And it's not a beautiful drawing, no. It's an ugly drawing. It doesn't make sense. But when you play it all in order, when you play it all in order, it's a beautiful movement from step one to step two, from step two to step three, and from step three to step four. Can I tell you that just because you might be in a moment of pain and just because God might have you in a waiting season does not mean that he does not have blessings waiting on your life. It doesn't mean that he's left you to die. It doesn't mean that he's left you forsaken. 
It just means that this is a stretching moment. You see, forward motion is impossible without a little bit of stretch. Forward motion is impossible without a little bit of crushing. We can't move forward unless God moves us in areas like this. But like Mr. Campbell said, it doesn't come without questions, right? That's natural. That's human. We, we, we don't know why. We want to understand where God is taking us. We want to understand why these things are happening. So he does question God. He said, listen, I did this. I, I bought this land. I just want to let you know I'm in. I, I did what you asked me to do, and that's, that's, I'm, I'm committing to this, God. But you've got to understand, I do have some questions. I want to know why you called me to buy and purchase land that I can't own, that I can't possess because it's already being taken over by my enemies. And God looks at him, and his response was another question. Don't you love it when you ask a question and someone answers you with a question? Isn't that kind of frustrating? Has anyone ever done that? You ask a very specific question, and someone looks at you and asks you a different question. You're like, that wasn't my answer. But sometimes the next question they ask is exactly the answer. Because Jeremiah questions God, and he says, God, why are you asking me to do this? When I can't even own this land, and Israel is about to be overtaken, and we're all about to leave into captivity. And God responds and says, is there anything that is too hard for me? Is there anything that is too hard for me? So today, we might be looking at our situation. You might be walking back into your job Monday, and you don't understand why your hours are all messed up and why you're having to work more hours because we had to lay some people off. Or maybe we're all trying to figure out how to get our kids to school because we don't understand the schedules and everything's pulling at our time. We don't understand the finances and how this is all going to work out in this global pandemic. We don't understand the political climate of anything that's going on right now. And we're saying, God, I want to follow you, and I know that you're asking me to step deeper and deeper into your community, and you're asking me to step deeper deeper and deeper into the body that you have created. But I'm having a question. If I step out in faith and if I walk after you, will you be there? And God is looking at us and he's saying, is there anything that is too hard for me? Is there anything? Come on, let's think about it real quick. Is there anything in your life that is too hard for an almighty God? Is there anything in your life that is too hard for a God who has perfect knowledge, who saw you before you were born, who created you, who thinks good thoughts towards you? Is there anything too hard for that God? There's nothing too hard for him. That's the blessing. You see, and that's where it turns around for him. He says, he recounts his, uh, his judgment of Israel. He said, now, Jeremiah, some things have to happen. You know, you've walked away. Israel walked away, so they have to go into captivity. But if you'll watch real close, the reason that I'm asking you to buy this land is because I am going to bring you back. You see, this pain right now is temporary. This, this captivity right now is temporary. But I want to understand, I'm about to do something great. You will be in captivity, and we are going to scatter the Israelite nation all over the place. But there is coming a day. There is coming a day where I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring everybody back to where they're supposed to be. And on that day, guess what? The deal that you made with me today, that investment that you made today will be honored when I come back and honor that blessing and that investment. Can I tell you that sometimes it won't make sense for us to spend so much time in a church building like this. Sometimes it won't make a lot of sense to spend every day in prayer and fasting or in times of devotion because it seems like everything in the world is so against that type of idea. But can I tell you, when God says, if you'll just draw nigh to me and you'll get a little bit closer to my spirit, I'm telling you, I'm going to pour out something on your life. This pain might be temporary, but if you'll start investing your time in my spirit, invest your time in my word, I will bring it back to pass. You see, I believe in a God who came down to earth. He loved me so much that he came down on this earth and he died on a cross for my sins. But not only did he die on a cross for my sins, he rose up again and he said, listen, I'm sending back my spirit. I'm sending back my spirit. You know why? Because I can't stay on the earth. You know the disciples didn't understand. They were saying, God, we, we thought you were going to do this whole kingdom thing here. That's what the Messiah was supposed to do, come in and establish his kingdom on earth, right? That was the mindset. They said, where are you going? You just raised yourself from the dead, and now you're leaving? You're going to go back to heaven? Where, where are you going? And he said, no, don't you understand? I'm going to leave right now. I will be back. But right now I'm going to send you my spirit. But guess where I'm going? I am going to prepare a place for you. 
You see, God honors that investment because in this temporary world, we can get so distracted. And in the temporary, we can get so focused on what is immediate and what we need right now. But God is saying, if you'll just take the small investment today, if you'll just spend a little bit of time in my word today, guess what? I'm going to honor in eternity. I'm going to honor it on a day when no one but never ends. I'm going to honor it on a day when I come back and I catch you all up in my spirit. And I'm going to take you to a land that never grows old. I don't know if anyone else gets excited about that, but I get pretty excited when I start to think about that. Oh, there's a God who says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I love you, and I'm doing this for your benefit. Oh, Jesus' name. I wonder if we could just take a couple of seconds. Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing and your power. Jesus, we worship your name. Hallelujah. 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 So maybe we have doubts. I don't know. Maybe it still doesn't make sense because it, I know, I know. It's really easy for me to get up here and it's very easy for me to talk about this because that's what we expect the preacher to do, right? We, we kind of get the, the, the role and the mode of church. We, we kind of get in that, that routine and we know that this is where we're going to come get our pick-me-up to get us through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We'll have midweek service. Then that's our pick-me-up until Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? So I understand that up here it could be easy to listen to me and say, oh, that's very easy of you to say, and I, I, I'm grateful for the encouragement, but what are you going to tell me tomorrow when I walk back onto my job and things are hard? What are you going to tell me tomorrow when I have to send my kid to a school? I'm not sure they're going to be safe. What are you going to tell me tomorrow when, when the political, like everything gets worse, when, when it gets closer and closer to all these things? What are you going to tell me that day? You see, maybe... Our doubts are what is holding us back here for just a second. I don't know, because it's easy to say, but maybe it's not so easy to live out. And maybe you've never, maybe this is your first time experiencing church, because sometimes that has an effect on our faith as well. If you're new to this, and you've never experienced the glory and the presence of God, it can be a little intimidating, right? You don't understand maybe some of the things we're talking about. You don't understand some of the, the words and the terminology we're using. It's intimidating, but and you know there's something bigger going on. We can feel that. We had a great worship uh, service today, and we could feel the presence of God moving, but maybe you've never experienced that. And maybe you're looking at me, and, and maybe we could all be like Jeremiah. We feel like we're stuck in a prison right now. We're stuck in a prison of our own worry, and we're stuck in a prison of our own fear, and we're saying, God, I know you're good. I know the basic nature of who you are, but I just don't see how it's going to work out. And so we won't step out. We won't operate in faith. We won't take that next step and that next investment. Or maybe you're saying, you just don't understand how messed up my life is. Maybe we're just hitting some of the, the hot button issues that we're talking about, but you don't really understand what's going on in the inside of my life and my family. You don't understand what's been in my past. You don't understand how messed up my situation is. And I know that you're talking about a great God, and I know that you're talking that he can do anything, but surely he can't reach a life like mine. Surely my situation is too big for him to handle, right? Maybe that's what holds us back. You see, why would we make that investment when we're not sure it'll come through? I was blessed with the opportunity a few years ago. We went to uh, the nation of Greece. And we got a chance to travel to see some of these islands and everything. And I, I'm, a very strange, I'm a very eccentric person. I, I love old things. I like old uh, like equipment, old uh, brass, like shipping equipment and all this type of stuff. So it's kind of antiques. I like it. So it's, my, it's a hobby. I, liked, I just like old things. And so we were walking around Rhodes one time, and I, I saw this shop that had a lot of antique old equipment, sailing equipment and things of that nature. I said, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I told my dad, look, I'm going to run in here and just see what happens. So he went with me, and we're walking through this shop, and I'm, I'm going nuts. I'm like, oh, look at this, and it was, it's old this, and look, it's old rusty that. And I'm just, I'm picking up everything. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was very interesting. And all of a sudden, out of the corner, there was this, this little man. He's only about this tall. And he walks up to me, and he's probably, he had to have been maybe 85, 86, maybe 90 years old. But he walks up to me, and he says, he goes, you like what you have in the store? I say, yeah, I do. I, I love what you have in the store. It's a beautiful shop. He says, you, you, you like everything? You I say, yes, I think it's beautiful. You have a great shop. He says, no. He said, follow me. And I said, okay, I don't know what this is. And I was a little scary. Like, I've never been to this place before. You always want to be careful when you, like, go overseas and someone's like, no, 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 we don't, like, follow me. You know? <laughs> I don't know where this is going, but uh, anyway. So we, we follow him through, like, these little back alleys and streets, and all of a sudden he gets to this little hole in the wall. 
Literally, it's like this little door cut out in the, the wall of a building. And when you step through the door, it opens up into this massive workshop with pots and pans, everything hanging from the ceiling, and a work table, and, 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 and grinders, and saws, and, and, sand, and, and sand blades, everything. This was his workshop. This is where he comes to do his work before he goes to the shop. And we started asking him questions about his life, and he said, my name is Michaelis, which is Mike, so, which either means we don't have a lot of beautiful names for Mike in America, or he was really trying to simplify it for us Americans. Because he had this beautiful name. He's like, my name is Michaelis. And we said, we were trying to pronounce it. And he said, just say Mike. So we're like, all right, Mike, tell us about your shop. And he says, I do this for a living. This is, my, this is what I do. He said, during the summer, everyone comes and they come to the islands. And they, they, they buy these beautiful homes. And they buy all this equipment. And they have all of their summer parties and social gatherings. And they do all these things, he said. But after they leave for the winter... They abandon their homes and they take all of the nice fancy things that they bought for all of their parties and they throw them out because they're not going to use them the next year. They'll just come through and buy new things. He said, and as they sit here on the island of Rhodes, they begin to rust and they begin to wither and they begin to fall by the wayside. He said, but what I do, he said, I find the broken things. He said, I find the broken things. I walk over the island. And I find the broken things. And I take them back to my workshop. And I make them beautiful again. You see, it may not make sense when we invest in a God that we can't see an immediate response from sometimes. And we may be sitting here, God, like, I know that you want good things for my life, but you don't understand how ugly my life is at the moment. You don't understand what I'm going through and, and the type of pain and the, and the type of things that are happening for me right now. You, you wouldn't even begin to understand where my family is at right now. And God's saying, no, if you'll walk towards me, I am the God. I find the broken things. I find the broken things and I take them back into my workshop and I make them beautiful again. You see, he looked at Jeremiah and said, look, I know that your life is pretty messed up right now, and I know that you're trying to walk after my glory. I know you're stuck in prison. I know the nation of Israel is going to be taken captive, but if you'll just make an investment in my glory and my promise today, guess what? Years from now, years from now, I'm going to take the broken Israel, and I'm going to bring it back into my kingdom, and I'm going to start piecing it back together. I'm going to take it in my glory and my anointing, and I'm going to put the glue on there, and I'm going to anoint it and heal it and bring it back and it's going to be a beautiful nation yet again you see jeremiah understood in faith at that moment when i step out and make an investment today i'm not investing in my situation right now i'm investing in an eternal destination i'm investing in an eternal kingdom that god is coming to bring me investment today yes your situation might be bad today we might be going through a hard moment right now but guess what every day that you spend in the presence of god is an eternity every day you spend in the presence of god is an is an opportunity to access his glory, to access eternity. You see, I always thought it was interesting. When we get down, this is, I talk about the right of redemption today, right? What does that mean? Because when I think of redemption, we think of, you know, obviously a sinner's redemption. That's what we, th we think of being forgiven of our sins, absolved of our sins. And that's right. But when we talk about the right of redemption in this passage, he said that his cousin came to him and said, listen, I have this land that I want to sell to you, correct? The right of redemption is yours to buy it. The word redemption in this passage means the right to redeem or purchase property based on kinship and family. You see, Jeremiah had access to the land even though he was in prison. Even though his situation was bad in the moment. He was granted access to purchase something outside of his control because of his kinship to a family member. It sounds pretty familiar to me because I believe that there was a God who robed himself in flesh and came down to earth and he followed the law. He did everything he was supposed to do. Just like Jeremiah, they had to go get the deed signed. They had to do it before a crowd of witnesses. They had to take one, uh, one deed and put it in the book of the open law and then they buried another one and they said this is the, the, the book of the closed law and this is where the deal has been done. And there was a God that came down to earth and says, I understand that the world has fallen into sin. And when we sinned and when man fell, we disqualified ourselves from the eternity that God wanted to give us, right? We separated ourselves from that. 
But God came down to earth and said, I understand what the law says. It, it requires a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. That's why he came down, robed in flesh as a little baby, and grew up and ministered. And not only that, but he ministered the greatest moment of his life when he died on that cross. And he said, through my blood, I have begun a new thing. And through my resurrection, I have begun a new thing. And when he sent down his spirit to fill the nations with his Holy Spirit, he said, I'm starting a new thing. It's called the body of Christ. You see, when, when you, you repent and you turn away from the ugliness and the situation of this world, and you're baptized and buried down into the name of Jesus, and you raise up again, and he fills you with the Spirit, you have not just gone through a process. You have become born a new creature into a new body, and you are his child. We are children of God. We are his kinship. We are his kinship. We are the sons and daughters of the Almighty God. So therefore... Therefore, the right of redemption, based on kinship, is ours. So I don't know what situation you're going through today, but know this. Your situation may not make sense today, but by the right of kinship, if you're a son and daughter of God, you can say, God, I don't understand what's happening right now, but I'm going to hold on to that promise because the right of redemption is mine to hold on to that promise. You made a way possible for me to believe in a better life. You made a way possible for me to hold on to your glory. You made a way possible for me to see heaven. So I'm going to make that investment today. I'm coming to a close if you want to stand. I can't see every situation in the room. I've only just met you today. I don't know what you're going to deal with tomorrow. I don't, want to, I don't know what you're going to deal with next week after I'm, I'm gone. and I'm just here with you. I'm blessed to be with you just for this one day. But can I tell you, although the situation might seem hopeless today, it's not going to be hopeless forever. All of this, what we're doing right now, is all temporary. It's, 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 it's all going to wash away. And God is saying, I went to prepare a place for you. So can I tell you today, whatever you're struggling with, whether it's fear of what's going on outside these doors, or whether it's fear of what's going on inside of here, there's a God who said, I paid for it all. I paid for it all already. And by the right of redemption, I gave you access to a power you don't have on your own. I know it's a simple message, and I know we've heard it a hundred times before, but I'm hoping I can just come in and encourage somebody today. This encouraged me because as bad as my life can get, I always have to remember that there's a God who gave me the right of redemption. As bad as my situation gets, I don't ever want to turn around on God and say, God, I trusted you, and you did me bad. You see, God never leaves the righteous forsaken, and he never leaves his seed begging for bread. He said, if my eye is on the sparrow, then don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear because I am going to look after you. The right of redemption is yours. You have access to an eternal God. So can I tell you, I don't know what you're dealing with right now, but if you want to take a moment, I don't know if you want to come around this altar. I know social distancing is important, but if you can find just a place to pray, why don't we spend a few moments saying, God, I know I don't understand every situation in my life at this moment. I may never understand the situation, but I'm going to take the time to invest in your spirit today. I'm going to take the time to invest in your word today because I know that that investment, that contract, is what gives us the right to redemption. In Jesus' name, we love you and we praise you. This moment is available to turn over every fear, every worry, and say, God, we're, I know we can't understand it, but I trust you. I know that your thoughts towards me are good and they're not evil. I know that you want to bless my life and you want to bless my family. I know that you have good things, so I'm making the investment today. Take everything I have. Take my finance, so God, I put that in your hands. Take my family, I, I put that in your hands. Take my job, I put that in your hands. Jesus' name. Come on, there's victory in knowing an eternal God. There's victory in knowing an eternal God who sees you in this moment right now. 
He saw you from the first moment you walked through this door. He knew what you were dealing with. And he's opening up an opportunity for you to step into that area where you can access his eternity. You can access his glory in this moment. Hallelujah. 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 I'd like us to pray just another minute or two, but let me, uh, first of all, thank Brother Pettigo. What a great word, clear word from God. Um, If I can tie it in with what I feel like God's trying to do in this period of time. When COVID started, uh, several people said, and, and I said from the pulpit, I felt that God was going to sift the church. And not to be mean, but he, he's, he's building something in us. He's letting us be in prison while he's taking care of some things. And eventually... Our commitment right now, while the world is going crazy, is very important. But right now, you're going to feel less like committing than ever before. There's going to be a lot of excuses not to be as committed to ministry, not as committed to prayer group, not as committed to, to services. And you felt it. You felt, you know, you got a good excuse not to be as committed as you used to be. After all, COVID, COVID is an excuse for everything. Every place I go, they're, uh, like, I, uh, we, we went... Uh, the other day we took a day off, went to the beach. Uh, there's this boardwalk. I won't name the town because I'm still mad at him. I parked. <clears throat> I parked in a two-hour parking space. Later went back and moved the car to another two-hour parking place. <clears throat> when I got back to the car, there was a ticket there. Because there, when they say two hours, they mean two hours in the whole area. But because of COVID, parking... Tickets were 150 instead of $75. Why, why double the parking? Because of COVID? I don't know, but COVID's the reason for everything. COVID's the reason I sleep in now. It's the reason I got off my diet. COVID's the reason I can't go mow the lawn. COVID's, you know, everything is an excuse, right? And, and God's saying, you know... I'm not asleep right now. COVID's not messing with my plans right now. COVID is having its effect, but uh, I'm still doing everything I said I was going to do. So God's called us. Uh, you, you know what? I, I was reflecting the other day on where God gave me my start in ministry. When I was 13, 14, 15, I started teaching Sunday school. And about 16, 17, my, my friend and I started a bus route. So this is where I learned how to minister. Uh, this is how my week went. During the week, I needed to prepare my lesson for Sunday, right? I'm, I'm a teenager. I, I need to do school and everything. I worked after school. I still needed to prepare my lesson. And then Saturday, me and my friend went out for two hours, and we went to every house we were going to go to on Sunday to see if they were coming on Sunday. And, uh, you know, I was a teenager. I had things to do, places to go, but... Uh, God asked me to do this. Then on Sunday, we would get up at, and we'd have to be at the church at 8 o'clock. And we'd have to warm up the old 60-passenger bus. And, you know, especially in the 20-degree weather or 10-degree weather or below-zero weather. And, and we'd warm that thing up. And then we would make our rounds for two hours. And we would get to the church at 10 and then at 10 o'clock, I would go down to the primary class and teach my class. And then I would get back on the bus and take everybody home. And I would get home at 2 when everybody else was done eating and I'd eat leftovers. And then Sunday night, we'd go back to church. And some of us have uh, we've grown soft. Boy, boy, I have a heavy load. I host prayer group once a month. I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying we give ourselves a pass and we give ourselves a pass. And God comes to us and says, I want you to take some risks for me. Oh, COVID. Oh, I've got things to do. He's looking for some courageous soldiers. He's looking for some people who are, they're so convinced God is going to do this great thing that they're willing to give up a couple hours on Saturday if they need to for ministry. They're willing, uh, you know, my wife does two services on Sunday now, and then she'll do a, a time for ladies. And, you know, we'll, be, we'll get here still today. We'll get here at 
at 9 o'clock, and we won't be done till 4 o'clock. I know that's my job, but if I was not the pastor, I would do that. that that's how I would interact with my church. Because I've learned that I'm investing in eternity. So for those of you that uh, you're not earning something, you're not trying to be noble, you're, you're seeing the kingdom and you're investing in the kingdom. You're saying, I- I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to put in the time because this, this great thing that God has planned for me. And so while I don't see what's about to happen, I don't see my way out, as was so eloquently said. I, I don't know what's coming to pass. The risk is I'm going to invest in the kingdom today. I'm going to teach a Bible study. I'm going to come over here and work on the church. I'm going to, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to worry about it, and I'm not going to feel like I'm some great hero. That's just I do that because I see what God's going to do. If I hadn't learned to do that at that age, I probably would just be a, a good Christian right now. I wouldn't have the joy of full-time ministry. I wouldn't have the joy of having touched many lives. I'd, just, I'd be going to heaven, and I might touch a few lives on the way, but my level of sacrifice would be so minimal that I wouldn't really touch a whole lot of lives. I'd just take care of me and my own. But if you really believe in this thing, you jump in with both feet, and you say, I don't care if I'm in prison, and I don't care how bleak it looks. It's that kind of commitment. So I, I'm not trying to put a wet blanket on it. I'm putting, I'm putting a level on here. I'm, I'm asking you in just a minute when we, when we begin to pray again, if you would physically move somewhere, whether it's to a corner or uh, two places down or s- some way, uh, I've noticed that since we haven't had altar service, sometimes we don't open up quite as much as we need to because we're used to coming down and opening up. So in a minute, I'd like you to move somewhere. And I'd like for you to think of this sermon in terms of what am I willing to risk for the kingdom today? What, what did I used to do two years ago that I've let slide because I've got good excuses now? I, could I pick that up and say, no, I still believe in the kingdom. I'm still going 100%. I don't care if it's COVID, and I don't care if I'm older, and I don't care what's happening. I believe in what God's doing. I'm going to take a risk. That's what Jeremiah did. He bought property when it didn't look like it was worth buying. Would somebody here risk for the souls that God said he's going to add to the kingdom two years down the road? It might be that this morning you'll recommit to your prayer group, preparation for your prayer group like you used to prepare for your prayer group, and it could make the difference in a family and another family and another, because you commit today. So I'd like you, if you would, to allow God to take this to a few minutes of commitment, and then we're going to move to some rejoicing. Could you move somewhere physically, kneel or go stand somewhere, somewhere move physically, and let's take just a few minutes to commit to God. God, we come to you believing so much in your kingdom, believing so much in what you are going to do, believing so much, Lord, that you're going to use us, that we resist the enemy and his temptation to be lethargic, his temptations to be apathetic right now. All the excuses that he's giving us to be less than passionate and wholehearted. All the time that we're not investing because we've got too many other things to do. I pray that you would allow your conviction right now to move through this congregation and call us back to fullness of ministry. I pray, God, that you'd give someone in this room a fresh desire and a fresh commitment to to invest time and energy into reaching the lost to invest time and energy into their prayer group and seeing it grow and seeing your kingdom prosper. I pray, Lord, someone who teaches classes would feel a fresh desire for the time those start up again and they would be willing to invest their time and their energy. They would not be apathetic and they would not allow it to wane in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you would give us vision today, a fresh vision of what you're going to do in this last day. I pray you break the back of what the enemy's trying to do 
by giving ex excuses. Uh, I pray, God, that you would help this congregation to break through the sifting process uh, and to not give in to apathy or lethargy, to not give in to laziness, to not give in to selfishness, uh, and to, to not give in to all the feelings the enemy is trying to deaden them with and trying to put out their light with and try to keep their ministry from flourishing. I'm praying, God, that our Bible studies would grow. I pray, God, that our prayer groups would grow. I pray that you would give us opportunity to connect with people, even in this difficult time, to connect, God. And even though we don't see how you're going to do it, you are a God who is well able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. You're able to make a way where there's no way. You're able to make a stream in the desert. You're able to make the desert blossom, God. I believe in you to do that, God. Let us feel your passion rise up in us, God. Let us feel a fresh willingness to commit all, to die to flesh, to die to all of the, the negativism, to die to all of the reasons not to, to risk, and to step out in faith, to step out in courage, to step out in, 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 in complete self-surrender to you, to give ourselves 100% wholeheartedly, Lord, to give ourselves to you with passion, to give ourselves to you with wholeheartedness, Lord, unreservedly to you in Jesus' name. When you feel like you've really committed just begin to worship him there should be there should be a joy in the house because we've recommitted to him when you're ready just stand and begin to worship him when you feel like that you've really put it all on the line again god we give you all and because we've given you all we know that you're going to do great things through us we know that all the promises that you've made will come to pass because we give ourselves to you, because we spend ourselves for you, because we're wholehearted in what we do for you, because we're unreserved in our desire, in our giving. We're, we're, we're sacrificial in our lifestyle of giving. We care about your kingdom, God.